everyone. Uh, tonight, we have our Singspiration, 6 p.m., snack afterwards. Uh, plan to bring a favorite hymn, a favorite snack, and a testimony. I am looking forward to sharing that time with all of you. Also, you're encouraged to invite guests. Uh, I think it will be an encouraging and uplifting time for everybody. Steve McBride has begun taking uh, names and reservations for the upcoming baseball game on June 21st, so you can see him outside uh, in the fellowship area after service if you'd like to sign up for that. If you were not aware, and some will not be aware because maybe they're not a part of the uh, one call system or maybe it didn't go through for them, but this past week, Craig Higley passed away. He passed away Tuesday night, and they are planning to hold the funeral for him Tuesday on this week. And it will be at the Thomas Yoder Funeral Home in Napanee. The visitation will be from 2 to 4 p.m. The funeral will start at 4 p.m. And then after the funeral, after the graveside service, they will head here to the country church to enjoy a meal with family and friends. So once again, the visitation is 2 to 4 p.m., funeral at 4, and then a meal at the country church after that for Craig Higley. With that, let us, ooh, no, 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 I have a card to read. Almost missed that. So this is from Margit Vegsar. She says to us, dear church family, thank you for everything. The cards, flowers, money, and the patience because I do not speak English very well. I love everybody. God bless you all. And thanks again, Margit Vegso. And you know, um, it's very easy to have patience with Margit, and I think we all should because most of us only speak one language. Uh, Margit speaks two languages. And Margit is going to help Jenny and I with something neat related to our adoption. We have to create a picture book for our child, and we're eager to do it. It's a great idea. And once the adoption is made official official, um, the match, I should say, is made official official, we are to give Hungary uh, a document that's like 20 plus pages long, and it has pictures of us, pictures of our home, pictures of us doing things together, and it will have little short sentences underneath it, things saying like, here is mommy and daddy. Mommy and daddy love you very much. Here is where your bedroom will be. And uh, we don't speak Hungarian. So Margit is going to help us with the little translations and sentences related to that. So, of course, we can be patient with your, Engl patient with your English because, you know, most people don't speak two languages at all. And Hungarian is such a hard language. We've been, we've been trying it. It's a lot harder than Chinese. You might be surprised. All right. So with that, let us open with a word of prayer. Dear God, we are grateful for this time of worship, this time of fellowship, uh, this time of hearing your word preached. And Lord, we pray you help us to not be hearers only, but doers of your word. To not be like those who look into a mirror and then change nothing and walk away. But instead, Lord, as we look into the mirror of your word and we are confronted with changes that need to take place, that we would address those through and in you. And be thankful for, Lord, your truth that helps bring us into a right way of living and a way of living that is in fellowship with you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. I, too, am excited about tonight. Um, I love being able to join together just with church family anyways, but being able to share in fellowship. But more than that, um, I love hearing from all of you. So please come um, with some hymns in mind. Um, we will definitely have songs to fill the time if we need to, but I hope we don't have to sing any of the ones we picked. I hope we just get to sing everything that you guys pick. So, um, and come with some ideas um, from your heart, um, some different ideas, things that you're thankful for, um, some of your favorite verses or things that um, you could share that God's doing in your life. So we look forward to hearing from that. So, but for today... Um, we're glad you're here. So will you join us as we worship?
I'm just noticing a low battery indicator on my little PowerPoint wand here. So I don't know how long it has, but we'd probably better address it sooner than later. Thank you, Barb. It was at full battery on Tuesday, and then suddenly it's at no battery. That's technology for you. So I, thank you. Oh, oh, and now it's full again. I don't need to understand it so long as it works. <laughs> that's our, I think that's many of our feeling toward technology, isn't it? As long as it works. So uh, I am excited to begin a new four-week series, and this is going to be on uh, vision for the country church for 2023 and beyond. Uh, we are going to be uh, changing some things, I think, for the better here in coming months. Uh, one, we're going to be introducing a new Sunday school class starting May 14 for adults. And along with that, we will be um, offering, and I hope it, it's filled up, a Sunday school class for children from kindergarten to fifth grade. On May 21st in the evening time, we are going to start every first and third Sunday a corporate prayer time in the evening. And I will share more about that on the 21st, um, what that will look like, how we're changing things up. A uh, little brief preview for that, I guess. We're going to have three different themes on each Sunday evening. The first one I'm looking at at this time is to have as one praying for corporate prayer, the second praying for outreach, and then the third, praying for uh, the Etna Green and Bourbon United Methodist Churches, which are no longer United Methodist Church after their recent vote. I'm just praying for the Lord to help them through that transition they're going through. And one of the, um, let's see, one of the things I'd like to do during our corporate prayer time is have at least one emphasis that's not about us. So that first one can be about some local churches in the area. Uh, a following evening service, the emphasis could be about some missionaries that we're supporting, or it could be you know, a national need or community need or something like that. Um, I'm going to share a lot about it on the 21st. Um, so there's going to be four sermons coming up. This is the first one where I'm going to be talking about four visions for the country church in 2023 and beyond. This first one is serving together. And it's also, uh, it's a vision from the past and one for the future. I'll explain that in a bit. The second one is going to be on outreach. So uh, getting out there more, inviting people more, sharing the gospel more, um, to see more people come to know the Lord and more guests here at the country church with us. The third is on reaching and teaching children. Uh, I want to see, we, it's something we already do. A lot of these we already do right? There's, there's none of these that we aren't doing, but we're going to have a renewed emphasis on all of these things. But reaching and teaching children, I want to see growing. And then the fourth one will be on prayer, corporate prayer specifically. And one of the things that is going to make these, I think, interesting is our applications aren't just going to be on the individual, but we're also going to be talking about applying it as a church body. So what it will look like for us collectively to serve together to do outreach, to reach and teach children, and to pray. And this first one is on serving together or being many ministers together. And it is uh, me revisiting my candidacy sermon. So this is the sermon that I preached long ago um, that the country church gave vote on whether I would become the minister here at the country church. So uh, I'm not anticipating holding another vote after that. I, I hope, I hope when you hear it, you're not like we need to revisit, we need to revisit that vote. I'm not so sure anymore. Uh, but this is the text that I chose to preach on um, that that Sunday when I came to be a candidate at the country church. But it is the new and improved and updated 2023 edition. Now with 25% more applications for us today. So it has been changed a little bit. And I also changed a point 
um, something that I was reading through and I felt I didn't really uh, believe like I anymore like I did then. And I'll, I'll get there and explain that. So with that, uh, let us open with a word of prayer and let's revisit a vision from the past and then also explain how we can be working and doing it even better today and in the future. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we need you to lead and guide us through your word. Lord, it is your word, it is your truth, um, it is your vision for the church. You explain in these verses um, what you would have me and us and this whole body to do and how you would have us to function together to grow, to show love, and to serve you well. And so, Lord, we pray for your guidance over our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 11. And he, that is to say Jesus, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So I'm going to have to turn myself around several times to check our uh, PowerPoint this morning. One thing that we're going to do someday I'd like to see happen is have a nice screen in the back. The praise team will love it so that they can look up while they're singing songs. But guest speakers will love it too when they have a PowerPoint and change the slide because right now, I can't see if it changes without uh, moving backwards. But that, that may still be somewhat into the future because we have, there's always so many things that, that must be done first. But so for, first, verse 11, uh, let's first talk about the apostles, the prophets. They were the ones that helped lay the foundation of the church. Ephesians 2 verse 20 says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. The foundation they helped to lay included the writing of the Bible, which we have in our hands. To qualify as an apostle, one had to have been an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ and then personally commissioned by him for that task. An apostle literally means like an envoy or a messenger. It was a word that was frequently used to describe someone who bore a message from a king. That was an apostle. So the apostles were ones that um, Christ handed down his word, the Bible, to in the New Testament, and they would proclaim it to us as his messengers. Prophets, these were, uh, it was also a prophetic work that they were doing, but in the Old Testament too, that book, uh, those texts were written by prophets. And together, apostles and prophets helped to lay out the instruction, the foundation, the doctrine for the church. The foundation was laid by the apostles and the prophets with Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, when you hear that word cornerstone, if you're not um, a builder, the idea that you would probably get is a, a rock that is in the corner of a building. But actually, the cornerstone was the first one to be laying, and it was the one that all the other stones were laying around. It was the um, standard to give proper dimensions to the building. And so Christ, in giving up his, his body on that tree, dying, being buried and resurrected three days later, he became the chief cornerstone from which the rest of the building is built. So it's the little guiding stone put down that everything else centers itself around, finds itself properly placed so that the building is stable 
it doesn't tumble down. That's what the cornerstone did. The apostles and prophets laid the foundation upon which the rest of the building is being built. Evangelists, shepherds, and teachers help to distribute and explain the information, the teaching, uh, the foundation that is given by the apostles and the prophets. The apostles and prophets might not exist today, but we're still benefiting from the foundation that they laid for us. What does exist today are evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Why do they exist, and why has God given them to the church? And this might be something that surprises some of you. A lot of us might think that the reason that they were given is for them to do the work of the ministry. Um, there's been a large chunk of the church history where the, well, just even the very term that we ascribe to pastors and teachers and all these individuals is minister. And so there's been a common thought that it is the, minister, the pastors, the teachers and so on who do the work. They are the ministers and others come and just support them as they do the work. But what is taught to us instead in verse 12 is that their job is actually to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So their job is actually to help you be the ones to do the work of God, to be the actual ministers who serve, who teach, um, who love, who preach, who exhort, and so on and so forth. Uh, it is the responsibility of evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip or train the saints for the work of the ministry. They train the saints primarily through the Word of God uh, because their role is that of teaching. Think of apostle, the apostle messenger of Jesus. They are declaring something, a word, a message, a truth that Jesus has given to them written down in the Word. Prophet, same thing, a proclaimer of God's Word. An evangelist is a declarer of good news. And a shepherd and teacher, they're a guider and they're a teacher in God's Word. So in each of those roles, it has something to do with the explanation of God's will for your life as revealed in His Word. So all these offices were in some way related to the proclamation of the Bible. So what the ministers do, what the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers do, is actually create in the church body many ministers by equipping the saints all to be able to do the work of the ministry. Evangelists help to train individuals to know how they can share the gospel with other people. Uh, shepherds help to guide and bring out spiritual gifts, teach and to show care and love for the believers, and teachers help to explain God's Word to us, all with the goal that we would be able to be Sunday school teachers, that we'd be able to tell um, family and friends about Jesus, so that we would be able to um, give food to the hungry and to the sick and to the poor and so on and so forth. They are equipping us for these good works. So God has given certain people to help train the church for the work of the ministry. Their job is not actually to do the ministry for them. When people are being trained well and people are utilizing their training, then this, we are told, builds up the body of Christ. Verse 12, it is done so that the body of Christ will be built up. And using that uh, illustration of the cornerstone, the foundation, uh, going back to the building, imagine, if you will, um, the foreman, the one who are leading the work, could be the evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, but the workers are out there helping to build up that church, help it to grow, build in the walls, build in the rooms, add the couches, and so on and so forth, through the things that they do. That way. Okay, verse 13 until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So, unity here, unity comes from 
knowing Jesus. It comes through faith and knowing Jesus. Unity comes from being equipped with godly biblical knowledge through the writing of the apostles and prophets and its explanation and application today through the evangelists, shepherds, and teachers based upon that writing. So as uh, it is brought out before the church body, what God's Word says and how it equips us for evangelism, for um, sharing truth, and so on and so forth, it helps to unite us as we grow. As we grow in our training in godliness and we become more spiritually mature and more Christ-like, we therefore find ourselves growing in deeper unity. Imagine, if you would, a triangle. Um, at one end of the triangle is you, and then at one end, the other end of the triangle is your friend, and then at the top is Christ. And as we come to know Him and believe Him more and agree with Him more, going up and growing into Him, we find our unity with those across from us growing stronger and stronger because we know Him more, we are more like Him, we follow Him more, uh, He is directing our lives in unity, we agree on more and more things as we come to know Christ more. Now, a lot of people these days and for decades, really, have tried to de-emphasize truth. Uh, they would say that an emphasis on what is true and doctrine and belief and these sorts of things tends to lead to division, is the idea that's behind it. So if we um, get real deep into stuff and uh, focus on learning all kinds of truth, and that truth is important, then the idea is that, well, we'll actually just divide more because we'll find more things that we could be disagreeing on and we might get into arguments about this little bit of truth and that little bit of truth and so on and so forth. Um, issue with that idea is that it's presenting as if there's only two options, as if you could either, you know, first option is just ignore what's true so you can get along with other people, and then second option is argue with other people about what's true so you can't get along with them anymore. Uh, it disregards that there's actually a lot, of, a lot of options there in the middle that also exist. We are supposed to be speaking the truth in love. You know, we're not supposed to be speaking the truth and shouting and arguing. Uh, we're not supposed to ignore the truth. We're not supposed to speak the truth in anger. We're rather supposed to speak the truth in love. And so I would say it is very possible and, in fact, necessary for us to be focused on truth. It just has to be in a loving way. When we de-emphasize truth, that can sometimes reduce conflict, but even that isn't really guaranteed. And here is where I would say I think my beliefs on some things have changed over the years. I used to think, although I never liked the idea of de-emphasizing truth, I used to think, yeah, if you aren't talking about truth um, excessively, yeah, that could maybe lead to peace. But now I don't, I don't think that's the case at all. I think it's the opposite. The less we talk about what is true, the less truth is emphasized, the more conflict actually erupts. I think that conflicts actually increase the more that truth is ignored. I think it is... Um, an error to think that by not talking about truth, we will get along better with one another. Truth, and this is because, here's my reasoning, truth has become optional today for many people, and I don't think it has made us in any way more unified. Even if we were to grant that, if we were to lay aside truth and could get along that way by laying aside truth, we would still not be more unified. And the reason for that is because peace is not the same thing as unity. They're two different words. Um, I like peace, but unity is even a higher calling. It's peace with agreement. You can have peace with disagreement. That's not unity. Unity is peace with agreement. Without faith in Christ, without knowledge of Him, without growing upon the foundation laid by the apostles, there cannot be unity. There could be peace, uh, and I would again say I don't think there will even be peace for long. But unity is not the same as peace and freedom from
from confrontation. The more unity you have, though, the more peace and less confrontation, I believe, you will tend to have as a result. Unity is being in fellowship, in deep agreement with one another in what is truth. It's a bond centered around God's Word. Unity is really hard work, and I think that is why one of the reasons why we want to take this shorter, easier way out of just, I don't agree with that, but I'm not going to say anything about it so that we can just live in peace over this. It's a lot easier to do that, but to have unity does require hard work, and it requires a lot of communication, and it requires intentionality and love behind it. Our culture swallowed a lie uh, a long time ago, I think it is even older than I am, called postmodernism. You might know it by the word relativism. Everything is relative. Postmodernism, relativism, those are the belief that there is no such thing as absolute truth. And it's expressed in ideas like this. Everybody's beliefs and opinions are equally valid. So let's not confront each other or judge. Uh, what's true for you is true for you. What's true for me is true for me. And I'm happy that your truth is working for you and my truth is working for me. So let's do our own thing. Let's be friends and we'll see each other in heaven someday, okay? That's the, the general expression of postmodernism or relativism. And it's really swallowed our, our culture whole. And for the sake of peace and comfort and ease, it can be tempting to go along with that and think that there's merit to that. But, you know, now that we're 50 years into the, the postmodern movement and can see where we are today, I would hope that we can see that we were sold a lie <clears throat> because it hasn't even led to peace. We haven't even gotten that, that peace that we were promised. We were lied to about that. Instead, it's led to a judge's kind of situation. I don't know if you've read that book. It's a really discouraging book where everybody is doing what is right in their own eyes. Everybody just lives for themselves, and they just do what they think is right, and it's really not working that well. That's what ultimately ends up happening if you abandon completely speaking the truth in love. You end up with everybody just doing what is right in their own eyes. And this is uh, why those offices of evangelist, shepherd, teacher, the foundation laid by the apostles and prophets is so essential. Because without the proclamation of God's Word, without us uh, growing and believing it, then we end up as instead of one body in Christ moving together and working together in love and growth, we end up as just a bunch of people who have their own ideas that, uh, about what's true and what's right and what's good, and we just start doing whatever is right in our own eyes, and we are not going to get along, ultimately. You know, we can maybe have peace, but even that is going to be hard at a certain point when what somebody wants to do is actively harmful to you. It's kind of hard to have peace at that point. You have to say something. So instead of buying into the lie that um, truth is divisive, we shouldn't speak it, um, instead of buying into that, we as a church want to be taking in God's Word so that we can grow closer to being like Christ. And we will become godlier, more spiritually mature as we do. And as we speak truth to one another, it must be in love. That, that is essential uh, because, yeah, if you don't do it that way, you won't have peace, that's for sure. So this is why I believe my most important role of all is preaching and teaching God's Word. And it's, it shouldn't be my opinion, my politics, my theories. It should be the unchanging truth of God's Word, because that is what's going to unify us, equip us to do God's work. And it will lead to more peace, but even better, it will lead to unity, which is a step above peace. So on to verse 14. It's good. So verse 14 says, So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So we have the complete Bible completed during the time when the apostles and prophets were laying the foundation of the church. And he's given, gave them and given shepherds and teachers today to give stability and maturity and safety to 
the church because biblical knowledge helps to helps us to be stable in times of instability and deceit. That way we're not going to be easily deceived like children. Uh, children, I love them, they're cute, but they're a bit naive. Um, children will easily believe lies because they don't have the accumulated knowledge to filter things through to recognize lies when they see them. Some people will even think it's funny to tell children lies uh, just because the child will buy it and they think, oh, that was you know terribly funny. I've told the child two plus two equals five. They, they went for it. Ha ha. I remember when I was a young child, uh, I would often tell my little brother things that were not true. I thought it was funny. Now I regret it deeply because he's my best friend. I wish I had never done that to him. Eventually, though, as he stopped being a child, as he stopped being a child, uh, he came to recognize and started to have a filter. And when I was telling him this, he was like, that ain't true. You know, there came a time when that wasn't working anymore. When I was trying, hey, do this, do that. Now, I don't believe you anymore, brother. We've been down this road before. I'm not so young anymore. And I remember when that happened. And that's because he, he was growing up. He was maturing. And, and the more we grow, the more we become mature, the more we have that ability to say, when we hear something, to be like, that ain't right. That's, that's, not, that's not good. I'm not going to follow that. Now, we might think that by virtue of our number of years, we've grown beyond that, beyond the capacity to be deceived and tricked into something that is false. But that's far from the truth. Everybody knows that we've heard stories for decades about televangelists who promise health and wealth if you give them money. Just send money and you get health. Buy this prayer hanky that I've wiped my sweat off on and you will get blessing, you know, all, all this sort of stuff. Religious fraudsters have been known to, to do that sort of thing. And even unbelievers can be shocked sometimes at their antics. And those are just the religious examples. You know, there are religious people who would deceive us. Um, I could spend all day delving into issues like scam calls, um, ungodly philosophies, fake news. There's just so much out there that's not true. Um, and if we have no filter, we will be like children getting tricked by all of it. God's Word helps to stabilize us, keep us from being children who are um, swayed this way and the other by every um, cunning thing that people devise to deceive us. So God has given churches, evangelists, shepherds, teachers to help ground Christians in the stabilizing truths of God's Word to keep us safe from the many frauds and false information that's out there um, we are being assaulted with. And it turns out that this task of truth speaking is not the sole responsibility of the shepherds, evangelists, teachers, and all these individuals either. Because when we go to verse 15, we see, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. We are all to be speaking truth to one another. Uh, this is yet another way that we are all being equipped to be those who do the work of the ministry. It's not the sole responsibility of the shepherd and teacher, actually, to be proclaiming truth. Rather, he is to train us all so that we are better able to speak the truth in love to one another. Evangelists are the primary um, source of teaching us how to proclaim the gospel. Shepherds and teachers, primary source for training the body in the truth of God's Word. But everybody should be speaking the truth to one another. So as we hear and receive and grow in the Word, we grow in our ability to speak the truth in love to those around us. And in so doing, we all grow up in every way into Christ who is the head. We all start to grow closer and closer to Him, this body moving more and more to be like Christ. So Christ is the chief cornerstone, the one that the whole foundation is built around, and upon and in line with Him, the whole church is built. And from this cornerstone, the apostles and prophets laid a foundation, God's Word, and then uh, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers help to proclaim it, kind of think foreman in a construction project, and then the church 
speaking truth to one another in love, just help it to grow up more and more into a stable, loving, uh, mature, grounded, unified building or body or whatever illustration of Christ. And we're all to be doing our part. We're all ministers. We're all speaking the truth and love to one another. Verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So in this uh, verse here, he's switched over from the analogy of a building to the analogy of a body. Every member of the body serves a purpose, and that purpose should be fulfilled in a loving way. So the ideal level of health for any body is for all the separate parts to be functioning properly. And whenever something is not, we call it a sickness, we call it an injury. Um, Whenever there's been like a broken bone that has to be put into a cast, call it an injury whenever somebody has become sick and so on. The ideal is that every part of that body All the fingers, all the tones, all the muscles, everything is working as it should, working healthy, working together. Not every member of the body also, not every member of the body serves the same function. Now imagine if we were all hands, the body were all hands, it would look horrifying for one, you know, we're talking about some kind of horror show if everything were just an arm sticking up with a hand on it. I think I read that in a scary book sometime. Um, But we'd also be useless and non-functional, you know, if the body were just a hand. How now is it to get its nourishment? You know, where is the stomach to digest the food? Uh, Where are the intestines to process it so that the hands can even move around and wiggle? How can they see to know what they are going after? Uh, The the body would be a horror show, totally useless, totally non-functional if every part of it were a hand. In the body of Christ, it's the same way. Every member has been gifted in certain ways. The Bible describes gifts of help, teaching, exhortation, mercy as just some examples. The growth and health of this body is dependent upon each individual member faithfully performing its role, and the edifying service that each member performs must be done in love. There are several ways that we can fall short of this ideal. And both are very easy traps. All three are very easy traps for us to fall into. The first way is simply by one person or multiple one persons choosing not to obey God's call of service in their life. God has called you to be a helper or God has called you to be an exhorter, but you are choosing not to help and not to exhort. It's like the right hand refusing to pick things up anymore. The right hand just says, I don't want to be that. I don't want to do it. I don't want to lift it. When this happens a little bit, the body can get by. You know, if your right hand is injured and it's not lifting something, well, the left hand can start to pick up the slack. It's, it's not going to function as good as, as if both hands were doing it, but now the left hand is starting to do more. Maybe the body will start to say, well, I guess I'll just put this on my head and, and balance it. I've seen people do that before. Finds ways to, to compensate for that member that's not functioning anymore. But if enough people start to do this, then the struggles really start to compound on the remaining parts of the body that are working. A lot of churches are in the place, a place of suffering, where 20% of the people do 80% of the work. I'm happy to say that is not us. I'm so happy to say that. And I also want to clarify, just if you just because you don't have a title next to your name doesn't mean you're not serving, right? You know, and just because I don't know that you've done something doesn't mean that you haven't done it. You know, there are people who are out there inviting guests, loving people, serving in this way. I have no knowledge of it. I don't need to. So I don't want to say just because you don't have a title next to your name or something like that, you aren't serving. But there are churches where it's like 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work. Not here. We can... We can Of course, always do better. Everybody can always do better. But this is a serving church, and I love that. I have been a part of a church 
that 20% of the people did 80% of the work. I was part of a church that was close to like 250 people, and at best 50 were serving. And man, that was so draining, just to your spiritual life, to your health, to your emotional health. Uh, those 50 people felt so worn down, so beaten, just to, 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 to maintain the services that feed 250 people, all the different services during the week, all the different events, all this, all that, maintained just by 50 people. Whew, morale was not good. We felt more like a church of 50 that were entertaining the other 200, and that's not healthy. So they, we were developing an attitude toward those who weren't serving as much. We were developing this bad attitude about it, and it's just not healthy when that's happening. Another way that this can happen is when someone goes to fulfill another person's ministry by doing the work for them. And this is really easy to do because we're, sometimes we're just there and it's like, okay, I'll just do this. Um, and it's simpler, it seems to be, when we do that. Like when someone who is really a helper proceeds to take over someone's role of teaching. And sometimes this can happen kind of out of necessity because the person isn't, is literally not doing the work and so they come along and do it. Other times, it's just out of convenience. I'm here, so I'll get it done. Again, if this happens a small bit here and there, the body manages to get by. Um, the right arm moving to pick up everything and drag the body around and so on, that can work, but it's definitely not optimal. And what ends up happening is the right arm, like, get, you know, like really strong, while the left arm withers away to a stick, and then the body is called to pick up, do some heavy compound lifting of like this huge rock. And the right arm is like, oh, and you just can't do it now because the left arm has been withering. It's not been serving. It's not been doing what it should. The right arm thinks, man, I'm awesome. I'm strong. I feel so fulfilled. The left arm is, you know, just shriveled up at this point. Um, I've been a part of a church that was this way too. And again, I'm happy to say we're not this way. Again, we can always do better. Uh, but this is a church where, uh, like an elite one or two, do the work. At the one that I went to, the pastor did most of the work. They had that idea that the pastor was the minister. They do the work, and we support the minister with our finances or with our prayers so that they do the work. And a major problem with that is that meant not a lot of work got done, because one person doing the work, you know, they only have, I didn't do the math, they only have a certain number of man hours per week. And it's pretty small when you compare it to the man hours of 100 people. So first problem, not that much is getting done because only one person can do so much. The bigger problem was that all those other people who could be serving were not getting opportunities to serve, and so that was stunting their spiritual growth, causing them to not live their, their best Christian life that they could be living, because they aren't finding an outlet to serve and, and teach and all these things that they should be doing. One final way that a church can fall short of this is when people aren't using their gifts in a loving way. This could find its expression in people serving out of self-interest. They just serve because themselves, for themselves. Or they're using their position to promote themselves. It could find its expression in a rude or overbearing teacher or a helper who is a complainer or an exhorter who likes to shout at other people. This is akin to a body that's at war with itself, punching and kicking and arguing with itself. Once again, I am so glad we're not this way. Um, this is probably the single most destructive thing that a church can be. I've not been a part of a church that was unloving. But I know people who have, and I've heard plenty of stories, nothing saps the life out of the body faster than the body turning on itself in anger and no longer loving itself. 1 Corinthians 13 definitely comes to mind. Without love, we're just a bunch of worthless, clanging symbols in a room accomplishing nothing. That's what happens if we don't have love. Okay, so now on to the 25% more application for today. So first, these are just questions for us to think about as we think about Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, 
and how we individually and collectively can grow to resemble the picture God gives us in his word in a greater way. So first question we can ask ourselves, am I growing in knowledge of the truth so that I can be more like Christ and a stable and unifying force in the church? So first question to think about just on your own time, am I growing in knowledge of the truth? You do that by hearing people teach. You do that by spending time in the Word for yourself. And it helps you to be, one, more like Christ, two, stabler in deceitful times, and three, a force of unity within the church body. Second, am I considering myself to be a minister and servant of Christ, or am I counting on the professionals to serve me? So have I bought into that, that lie where really my role is just to support other people to do the work of the ministry, but I'm not really a minister myself. A very common idea that we have been taught for years. So think about, think about yourself. Do you regard yourself in this way? Do you think, I'm a minister and I'm a servant of Christ. I'm to be doing the work of ministry. Or are you counting on professionals to do it for you? Third, reverse that. Do I instead think that I'm the professional, uh, and it depends on me, and so I'm not giving room for others to serve and grow? Because that can work both ways. I'm going too fast. I see some people taking notes. So let me do a quick review. So first, am I growing in knowledge of the truth so that I can be more like Christ and a stable and unifying force in the church? Second, Am I considering myself to be a minister and servant of Christ, or am I counting on the professionals to serve me? Third, am I considering myself as the professional and not giving room for others to serve and grow? And fourth, am I serving in love? So, I don't know if I, I think, I, I think I'm blocking it a little bit if I stand there. Maybe I should have moved myself over here earlier. So some applications for our church, because uh, again, this is, this is intended to be a vision series uh, to help us grow in 2023 and beyond. Why revisit, why revisit this message? Um, what does it have to do with where we are going in the near future? Well, as we grow, we are only going to have to get better at this. You know, we, when we're going to add an two more Sunday school classes, when we're going to add a corporate prayer time. Uh, we're going to be adding this summer a lot of different evening outreach activities and that sorts of things to have happen. Um, if it's going to work, we have to do what we've been doing and get better and better at it for it to, to be pulled off successfully. The work of corporate prayer is inadequate when met by a few. And um, I feel that corporate prayer is going to be so important for meeting these needs. Um, first of all, because there is an adversary out there who doesn't like when we do good. And if we are trying to do it in our own power without petitioning God collectively for his grace and help and the work that we are doing, well, he will find a way to mess it up. Um, and he is so clever in what he does. He will stir anger in the heart of somebody. He will bring into the church something that shouldn't be there. And soon enough, we come into a situation where we find ourselves tempted to get into an argument, tempted to give a bad testimony. And the work that we've been doing of outreach and helping and reaching and teaching children and all these things suddenly ends up getting undermined. And the adversary is going to try and do it. He is going to try and do it. So we are going to have to be in prayer if we want to work well as one body and grow in these things. Second, outreach will be ineffective if you are involved. You know, if we offer new exciting Sunday school class for adults with kids, we offer a new Sunday school class for the kids, we have a Singspiration tonight, um, we have a puppet show someday and so on and so forth, and nobody's inviting anybody then those things aren't going to work. You know, we are dependent upon uh, other people in the body trying to do as they can the work of the evangelists, the work of the shepherds and teachers to invite friends, to tell them the gospel. The outreach can't just be done by the one or it's just not going to be effective. 
And children's ministry also going to suffer without servants. We will need more people to pull this off. And on we go. So I am excited. Um, I can't wait. When you see next week, I've already worked on the letter for the church family, all the exciting events that are coming up. And the outreach team is going to meet today and talk about some more. There's going to be so many opportunities coming up this summer for us to reach out, give opportunities for people to come to church, learn about Christ. Um, I am excited for what God is going to do. I can't wait for the corporate prayer time that we're going to have starting the 21st. So much prayer and thought has gone into it. I think you will find it exciting. You know, if you've been a part of prayer meetings in the past and thought they drug on or thought that, you know, not a lot was getting done or you felt you didn't understand, whatever, I don't think you're going to feel that way about the new way we're approaching this coming up. So I am so excited for what the Lord is going to do and looking forward to sharing more with you and coming messages about that. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you that all of us get the privilege of serving you. Uh, that we all get to live fulfilling lives in Christ Jesus by obeying you, obeying your word, and filling out the calling that you've called us to, uh, speaking words of encouragement when you've made us an encourager, showing mercy when you've made us merciful, teaching others when you've made us teachers, and proclaiming the gospel to those who need to hear. Thank you, Lord, for this rich privilege and purpose in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that we have one another to lift one another's burdens, because there are times when we can't do it. Uh, but friends, family, loved ones will come along and carry for a time that burden for us. Thank you, Lord, for designing us in that way. Lord, help us um, now to just be thinking about maybe friends, maybe family we can invite to our singspiration time together tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor, for your vision and your leadership. And I am very excited to see what's going to happen uh, with the country church as we continue to follow what the Lord has for us. So will you stand and join us as we close today?
great day. We hope to see you tonight.